welcome to another episode of the Being and Doing podcast, where I am inspired by an incredible individual that I found uh, everywhere in all the corners of the internet and uh, try to bring their stories here in this podcast in order to maybe bring a little bit of curiosity and a new spark for you to um, explore a new avenue in your being or in your environment. And today I'm really, really happy to be joined by Thomas Chamorro Premužić. Um, and I was thinking how to introduce you uh, because there is a lot of uh, kind of uh, factual things I could say. But one thing that I was with after listening to uh, the way you speak is a person that makes being human sexy. <laughs> And I thought uh, it's a wonderful quality in someone who is so productive. And I will start with a question. Uh, how do you combine the two uh, for yourself? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure to chat. And uh, secondly, you know, thanks for the overly kind introduction. It's definitely something nobody has ever said about me before, but uh, I'll consider putting it Maybe not in my LinkedIn profile, but somewhere a little <laughs> bit more informal, especially, um, you know, as the world is a little bit too sensitive to words like sexy, even if they're used in a, you know, I think pretty harmless way. So how do I combine? I mean, look, I, uh, when I think about myself, uh, I think, you know, especially through the years, I've mellowed quite a bit. I've become more corporate, more boring, less anarchic. So... You know, it's flattering that you still see a little bit of oomph or panache or, you know, um, if you want uh, some of the X factor that I think I had when I was younger. Now, you know, I just try to basically still call it as it is or as I see it. And I think that, you know, at least people who listen appreciate that there is a uh, uh, a healthy degree of skepticism that tries to use humor to state things that maybe are quite obvious, but not said enough. That's basically, you know, if I had to summarize my approach to at least my work, it would be that. On being human, you know, I am really, really intrigued and interested in how we need to redefine ourselves in a time where we are quite, you know, worried, paranoid, concerned about advances in AI, etc. So this is a a topic that is close to my heart and I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Mm. I like my head is going pop 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 but I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to keep myself uh, on track. But one thing that I want to backtrack a little bit because I don't think in the corporate interviews you have been doing is highlighted enough is that you have been a therapist. Mm -hmm. Uh mm -hmm. and I think it shapes you in a certain way when you go into systems and one thing that I'm sitting with is being in a therapist position, overly uh, maybe attached to attachment uh, theories and forgetting the cultural parent uh, is is quite, uh, it's misleading. But what I, I see you are doing now is bringing back the cultural parent and naming what is the messages we are getting culturally that then shape who we are so yeah. I'm wondering if you could say something about your therapist day yeah. and then yeah. maybe go from there yeah and look and I, and I and I think you have a background in gestalt right or yeah. a, a, so look I mean I remember um when I started my career I started in philosophy and then I migrated into kind of clinical psychology clinical psychology in Argentina at the time was basically Lacanian psychoanalysis mm. which was on the one hand, the most fascinating and interesting thing to study, especially if you think about crowded lecture theater with 300 people at midnight, you know, and a lot of smoke and anarchy and freedom. And on the other hand, not that practical when it came to actually treating somebody who had serious problems, psychological issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, throughout my career, I always kind of had this pattern of, being intensely attached to something and then being fed up and trying to go against it. And for me, you know, I spent three or four years actually working as a clinical psychologist. The beginnings were 
very interesting intellectually, but then frustrating from a professional standpoint. So I tried to kind of, you know, go into the other extreme and I moved to the UK to become a behavioral scientist and, you know, do neuroscience and experimental psychology. But to your point, I think a little bit of what you have learned and studied and embraced before always stays with you. And like when you look at Gestalt, you know, people might question the scientific validity or in mainstream kind of terms of Gestalt psychology, but some of the principles are so useful and reliable and used everywhere. And I think it's a little bit the same with psychoanalysis. Like, even though Freud made a lot of things up under the heavy influence of cocaine and in very intuitive ways and with very little evidence of small case studies which were unrepresentative even back then, like conversion hysteria in Vienna didn't extrapolate much to other places. His insights were actually really, really spot on. And today, even those who say, okay, you can't pay attention to this because it's not scientific, actually are reaching very, very similar conclusions. Yeah. Even if you look at mainstream neuroscience or cognitive psychology, et cetera. So, you know, um, yeah. And I think part, part of it is also that if you look at, uh, I mean, if you read or follow mainstream peer-reviewed articles in top scientific journals, they're so unintellectual. They're yeah. very, very focused <laughs> Thank on you. a very, very narrow <laughs> part, which is interesting. But if you know the finding, that's it. You know, yeah. probably if it isn't a meta-analysis, you cannot trust it because there's a replication crisis, etc. So, you know, I think humans are naturally... Uh, seduced by the story and the bigger picture and the theory. And I think, you know, that's what that part of my career gave me, that uh, appreciation of deep theory. Mm. And I maybe want to actually uh, stay a little bit in this place because exactly what you just named, I am I'm noticing that's where my frustration lies, being, being a, a scientist in this day and age, where uh, I think in one of your interviews, you, you were, you were, mentioning the importance of asking good questions but also in in one of your interviews what i thought is uh you you talk about data and how data now tells us uh where our biases are and but sometimes i'm thinking but how much time we do we know this in t instinctively mm -hmm. before the data tells us yeah. and how much are we using uh, losing and maybe using uh or abusing data in a way that kind of kind of shuts down our innate ability to to yep. to know things <laughs> without yep. them having to be got, godified by the data or approved or validated by by what data says yeah and godified is a nice is a nice uh, term uh look i think like with everything it's very nuanced more nuanced than the average person in today's time deprived age has the impetus or appetite to actually comprehend but you know i'm just actually rereading jonathan hyde's brilliant book the righteous mind why good people are divided by extreme values right which was written about 10 years ago but it's still so so uh, relevant and up to date today when you see, you know, polarization and uh, people divided even by trivial things, right? Especially in virtual environments. And I think his main contribution to moral psychology and really moral philosophy was the demonstration that first we feel and then we actually reverse the engineer data to fit in our, in, in with our feelings, right? So basically yeah. we're intuitive first, which obviously David Hume said 300 years ago, but he has demonstrated in a lot of experiments that basically things like disgust, pleasure, or even nostalgia actually conditions us to approve or disprove of something. And then, you know, you can basically find any arguments to yeah. prove yourself or convince yourself that you're right, which basically makes, you know, not just arguing, but cooperating and getting along with others very, very hard. On mm -hmm. the other hand, of course, you know, intuition is like any other psychological or physical trait. It's normally distributed. Some people have a lot of it. And some yeah. people have very little. And most people are in the middle, right? Often when I always bang on about being data-driven and evidence-based, um, you know, people respond to me and say, yeah, but what about Steve Jobs? And it's like, well, you know, 
I buy the theory or the notion that Steve Jobs and some other brilliant creators were probably quite intuitive, but the majority of people are not as intuitive. And also, I think to get to that level of intuition, you have to really develop deep expertise, right? I think when you develop deep expertise, which comes from a lot of you know time applying your talents and efforts, et cetera, to a very narrow domain of knowledge, then your intuition becomes data driven. Okay, maybe at start, there are some people who are naturally more intuitive. I think I buy that. That probably is a dimension of potential, right? If you even think of like a three-year-old improvising on the piano for the first time versus another three-year-old improvising on the piano, you know, there might be differences and that's intuition. But as we grow older, it's really a lot about the uh, time you invest in studying, analyzing, and developing deep expertise. And, and I, think I that... maybe would add to that gaining self-awareness because, exactly. because there is a part of intuition that's dampened by growing up in a family which you are told you don't feel that, you're not, you're not experiencing that. And then by default, you haven't given a head start to exactly. trusting what your what your reality is. And that, sorry, uh, you I interrupted you. So no, and I was going to say that's a that's a no, that's a that's a great um, sort of like uh, interjection and comment. I would say like everybody has experience. Also, the kind of uh, uh, I would say the fluctuating and intricate tension between developing knowledge or expertise on the one hand and then being creative like when you don't know anything about a subject you feel very creative but you're probably rubbish including yeah. you know the three-year-old that touches the piano for the first time or paints for the first time or you know sings something for the first time mm -hmm. and then as you develop more expertise and skills you feel constrained you can't be creative because and it's the same in science right if you spend two or three years preparing for your PhD and you read and you read, oh my God, everything has been done. What can I contribute? But I think at some point, there is that sweet point of kind of turning the balance upside down where your intuition will leverage or benefit from everything you learned. And then you can create, even if it's incrementally. And mm -hmm. so, it, you know, it, it's bad if you're lazy and if you want to be efficient, but it comes if you really apply your deep curiosity to your imagination. Mm. And I want to, uh, I had another thought because of my, one of my favorite books is um, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And yep. I, I really came to me because the end of that book is you cannot cut a knife with a knife and uh, life is lived uh, forward, but understood backwards, which kind of really speaks to yep. having sensation first and then making meaning and actually our agency is to exploring the meaning. And yes. that's something that can be in a constant flux. But I think it's something we don't practice either in workplaces or in families. And in addition to that, I think there is something I, I really was curious about, which is what you what you talk uh is about the polarization and how much we don't include skills in bridging those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the only place where, not the only, but like where I really learned that is my in my psychotherapy training, mm -hmm. uh, which you are held in this space where the person who is holding the group has the ability to hold that tension enough for things to start to be seen and i'm wondering do you have any idea how can this be translated into workplaces or into in more into general life well look i think um so first leftover comment to your last point uh, yeah. i think there is that wonderful quote by picasso that says something along the lines of like at the age of five i could paint like all these great masters but it took me a lifetime to learn how to paint like a child right yeah. and i think we will both agree that's a beautiful kind of uh, metaphor or analogy for what we're saying is like you know to really feel free and create you actually have to well you kind of have to know the rules of the game and master them before you can break them and that is you know there's a big difference between something he does and something a five-year-old child does, even though to the untrained eye, they might look very similar, yeah. right? And then on the other point that you're making, I think that, uh, look, in general, there's a lot of uh, potential to extrapolate from 
psychotherapy, including gestalt rules and principles to everyday work environments in the sense that I think actually all clinical paradigms and all psychological paradigms, uh, for example, uh, highlight the subjective nature of perception, highlight the um, pervasive impact of group level uh, consensus, uh, and also highlight their liabilities and their flaws. So, you know, that's not to say that the antithesis is like, okay, let everybody interpret reality in their own way and everything goes. And, you know, the wild west of especially kind of diluted, narcissistic, uh, Western American, Hollywood, LA advice, be yourself, let others adapt, etc., and other BS like that. But I do think that it's very, very helpful, especially at a time of polarization, to understand that maybe the way you see things is really quite arbitrary, quite incorrect, and that even if you are right, it doesn't mean other people can be naturally convinced that you're right and you have to actually work for it, right? So I think, you know, ultimately, I think uh, we could do better trying to dilute some of the individualism, rampant individualism, that is actually quite self-centered and not conducive to uh, cooperation, collaboration, or living with others, coexisting with other humans in society. And I think there are learnings in all these paradigms that can help us actually improve on that front. And I really, uh, maybe that's what I kind of uh, respect about your work, which is uh, you putting in the effort that's required to find the language uh, to reach to reach people. Because I thought it's really difficult, and and I was well, in one of your interviews, you've mentioned uh, about um, why we choose how you wrote the first article, how why we choose comp uh, confidence over competence, and uh, I was thinking about you were reaching the man that really needed to read this, because in a way you found the right words somehow. Uh, and that takes quite a lot of effort. I imagine it might have been quite easy for you, but I want to check in with you. Uh, what's the process of finding the words um, and and how do you work, basically? <laughs> well, this is a very difficult question. You know, first, I'm, you know, I'm going to push back a little bit on your assumption that I am reaching the people who okay. need to be reached because I think, look, I tell you, a little anecdote that actually maybe proves my point, which is, um, so the original article, why do so many incompetent men become leaders was written in 2013 for HBR. It, it was actually planned as a kind of response to Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In. Uh, my editor at HBR said, look, this book is getting a lot of traction. Obviously, Cheryl is, you know, quite famous. And I think, you know, her argument was well-meaning, well-intended. But my editor was familiar with my research and said, this kind of is like at the antithesis of what you're saying, because she's basically saying women should copy overconfident men, as opposed to saying, or as opposed to agreeing with what your research says, which is that it's better to have a world in which we promote and nurture self-knowledge rather than self-belief or self-awareness rather than you know self-confidence. So I wrote the article and then the brilliant title was Her Idea, right? So I would say behind every incompetent or competent man, there is a competent woman. Uh, you know, it became a smash hit. I think not so much because of the message as because of the title, but also because things kept happening in the world, whether it was, you know, Boris Johnson, Brexit, Trump, etc., that at least triggered uh, some anger or frustration in people. And every time something like that happened, you know, the article went to number one in, in kind of HBR's uh, most read pieces. But there was a six or seven year gap of separation between the article, which did very well, and the book. And HBR press kept telling me, you know, we really love you to do a book on this, but we can't upset most of our readers, which are, you know, I mean, 70% or 80% of our readers are male executives. <laughs> and my answer was like, don't worry. First of all, not all of them are incompetent. And secondly, those who are won't realize that this is a book about them. 
And this is exactly what happened. You know, finally the book was published with the same title. We agreed not to mention Trump, although we were going back and forth, back and forth. I mean, that's not the point, you know? The point is the principle, it's not a specific person. And uh, I get a lot of messages from not just women, but also men saying, oh, you know, I know a lot of people like this. And, you know, some of those people might be competent, but part of being an incompetent leader is about lacking self-awareness, is about overestimating this. You know, do you really think at any point in their careers, people like Trump or Elon Musk felt incompetent? No. And you could argue, actually, they are quite competent. One is about to go back to the most powerful job in the world, and the other is, you know, the richest man in the world and most successful entrepreneur. Then you have people that actually don't have the achievements, the track record, the privilege to back it up. But actually, their level of confidence is the same. Yeah. And, you know, somebody asked me recently, what has changed since the book came out? And now, especially, you know, whenever we're approaching or we are International Women's Week and Day, people ask this question. I said, well, on the one hand, nothing, which is why the argument still resonates and the book still sells. On the other hand, we have to accept that, you know, even like a 40 year time frame in the grand scheme of human evolution is a very short time frame. And, you know, you and I can tune into series like Mad Men on Netflix or other shows from the 50s, 70s, and you're horrified by the level of blatant sexism that you saw then. Now it's more benevolent, which is actually harder to combat. It's horrible. It's so insidious. It's, no, it's, it's like it's you harder. can't catch it. It's like an eel. And you're like, yeah. hey. this is the yeah. final stage, right? So when yeah. when even people think that they're being pro-social, egalitarian or feminist with comments that hopefully in 50 years time will realize were as sexist as, you know, watching Don Draper in Mad Men 50 years ago, fictional character. Uh, and I think Lean In will fit into that kind of narrative. Or, you know, telling women that they should apply for jobs even when they're not qualified. Or speak in meetings even when they have nothing to say. Or, you know, overcome their imposter syndrome. Or, uh, you know, showcase their ambition. All of those things are... I think uh, benevolent sexism indicators because we're still operating under the assumption that not just the male version of leadership, but the overconfident, narcissistic, and psychopathic male version of leadership is the norm. Yeah. Right. Which is how why you can see, which you know, it's a sad reality that when some of the women that actually manage to reach the top echelons of an organizational hierarchy fail sometimes because they weren't very good but sometimes because society is still against them they're ostracized they you know push back or hold back progress many decades and you know when men in those situations go through the same instance they go on to the speaking circuit and they become you know funny entertaining characters i mean you can oh. compare, you can compare adam newman the WeWork uh, founder and CEO with Elizabeth Holmes and just look at the, you know, and one is a multi-billionaire about to start his new, okay, you could argue it's obviously less detrimental and less harmful than pretending to actually uh, well, we, the we market have... of that analysis, right? But yeah. they're no different. They're the same. And the only difference is there's for every female leader with these narcissistic psychopathic features like Elizabeth Holmes, there's about 50 to 60 males that actually succeed more often than not. And I'm always sitting with that. What is a way without putting any anyone at risk of naming things um, that that just pass without any, mm -hmm. uh, any repercussions? <laughs> yes, exactly. And this is an interesting point because, you know, there are repercussions, whatever you say, whether you say something or not, et cetera. So I think, you know, if yeah. you don't yeah. show a minimum or a modicum of moral commitment or uh, attachment to certain values, et cetera, I mean, nobody cares about you. But then if you do, you know, you will antagonize some people, maybe connect with others. I think it's just, you can still, you can still have convictions 
but still understanding that maybe you'll have to tweak them. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe, you know, I think that's the beauty of, I think, openness to new experience and moral ambiguity in a good way. That's why when people say, you know, just be true to your values, I'm a bit allergic to that kind of others because that's basically, I mean, you know, unfortunately there's too many examples in history of what happened when people were true to the wrong values and you know some values are better than others the problem is we don't know it a priori we have to see in terms of the consequences that they have and everything has some pros and some cons so anyway you know I, i'm fascinated by this issue and i think even though i consider myself a uh, liberal in the traditional sense of the word uh, i i am much more interested and i find it much more uh rewarding to interact with people who don't think like me Mm -hmm. so uh, typically in social circles when you organize dinners or you go to parties or you see friends you know the majority of people think like you i am much more interested and fascinated by people who don't and then i try to ask questions and i try to understand and i try to you know i think you know when you meet a stranger in a bar or in an airport when your flight is delayed and you're trying to make chit chat and talk about things you probably go through five, 10, 15 minutes where you're both very, very friendly and everything's that until at some point you realize, oh my God, you know, there are views on A, B, C, abortion, guns, politics, climate change, whatever, equality, et cetera, are the other the spectrum. But I think when you are in person with somebody and you manage to empathize and make an effort to be tolerant, you can put these differences aside. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of human society. It's very hard to do this online and in virtual environments and of course ai is making it even even harder to have these experiences so on the one hand 85 percent of people see themselves as open-minded on the other hand probably less than 15 percent of people actually are mm. and i uh you you talk about uh inflating um uh, i don't know exact words you're using but inflating the our self view uh, i don't yeah, know yeah. exactly the words yeah. you you are Egos using or self yeah. views yeah and i am always i mean that's what that's what i speak about uh, especially with my friends who are therapists on instagram and i'm always sitting with uh what's my responsibility uh, sitting in in that be especially because there is the tendency of of showing the best parts of yourself and masking the parts that are not so presentable and i'm always sitting with how can i uh, and it, uh, there is a, a really uh, interesting article which is called um, uh, "Cultivated Uncertainty," okay. uh, in which it's a therapist. So it, he doesn't. I don't think he speaks on database, like ba data based information. But he says that there is something about being perceived as competent that's actually helpful for the client, uh, b being a therapist. But how far you get that? Uh, how far you go and sit in your quote unquote expertise yeah. uh, and allowing someone to idolize you to a point of taking their own safe uh, self agency. So I'm, I'm always sitting with, with that responsibility that my therapeutic role carries. And I'm wondering, uh, maybe you can say more about that from like a data standpoint. Yeah, this, I didn't know the concept, but I love the, you know, the terminology cultivated uncertainty. And I think, you know, um, there's definitely a really um, close parallel with the world of leadership or you know managers or bosses, which is what springs to mind, which is that, you know, I remember in response not to the book on why so many incompetent men become leaders and how to fix it, but even a book I did before on basically the perils of overconfidence or high confidence. Uh, I was speaking to a BBC journalist who had read my work and said, okay, you know, I get it. You're talking about that. And, you know, but, but she said, but who wants to follow a leader who says, I don't know. Yeah. Which is to your point. Or who wants to have a therapist who said, well, I don't know how to help you, right? On the one hand, of course, nobody. On the other hand, if we had a certain modicum level of maturity in followers or patients or clients, any rational person would want to be in that situation because most complex, whether at the individual team or group level, organization level, most problems are complex. So if your definition of a 
seemingly competent leader or therapist is somebody who says, don't worry, this is what you have to do, A, B, C, then you're mostly fooling yourself. And also you're making yourself vulnerable to all the kind of uh, bullshitters or kind of, uh, you know, uh, charlatans who may actually be in the worst category, which is they have fooled themselves into thinking that they know when they don't. I have a little bit more respect for those who are lying to the clients or their teams or the organization, because at least they have some self-awareness, right? So they're just pretending. They know, I mean, there's a little bit of imposter syndrome in the good sense there, right? So, but yeah, my response was in a rational world, you would have followers who appreciate leaders who say, I don't know, which doesn't mean, you know, uh, I won't know or I won't be able to help. Actually, I don't know is the first um, enabler of, but I'm willing to close the gap between my deficits in knowledge and what I need to know to help you. And by the way, we're going to do this together because in a knowledge economy, knowledge is distributed and others, et cetera, right? So I think we should be more, not just more open, but actually more uh, appreciating of people who have the true confidence to admit what they don't know because they're not desperately trying to show off or desperately trying to maintain. And that's the problem with sort of Instagram or social media, right? I mean, it has many, many potential utilities that can even combat loneliness. And, you know, I mean, people let people express themselves and even make a living out of it. But it is like people behave on a first date or in a first interview. It is just all the time showing your bright side features. And, you know, we have seen studies already on this you know, leading to increases in depression or neuroticism or anxiety, especially in teenagers. Because when you look at people, if you assume that people are so happy and so successful and even so good looking because they have these filters that, you know, make them look amazing. And imagine now that deep fakes and AI are becoming kind of a, so ubiquitous, then they look at themselves and they feel uh, embarrassed, if not guilty or horrified or shocked by their own flaws, or they end up distorting them, which means they become more narcissistic, right? So, I mean, that's the effect that we have to actually uh, look out for, I think. Mm. And I'm also sitting as I'm listening to you, I, I notice it in myself on the days where I'm kind of low and I go on Instagram, I do, I do feel like, oh, fucking hell, I'm failing so badly. Mm -hmm. um whereas on the days when i'm kind of fine i'm aware of that i i hold that in awareness that oh i know that like i know how it looks in how it how it is in the background so i kind of don't buy into it but it's really hard sometimes not to buy into it because in a way i really uh like at really hard times instagram was a really good place for me you know because there was so much important information that came to me through it and by the fact that the algorithm somehow learned what i need <laughs> and mm -hmm. what i was googling but on the other hand then there is a I think like a, a tipping point where it just becomes an echo chamber, which I'm always quite afraid of. And how do you how do you unecho yourself? Because the way yeah. the words the words I use for this is just I always wanted to break free from the collective unconscious. Uh, and like it was whether it was of my country then when I went out of my country then it's from the scientific community then it's also like from the therapeutic community because if you are kind of locked into a community you don't it's there is a point where you stop questioning the values of the community when they become a norm yeah and and I wonder how do you cultivate the uncertainty of norms yeah so um so I, I actually, you know, spent quite a bit of time trying to unecho myself or to exit kind of my filter bubble. I would say at least more than is advisable for people unless they have a certain degree of intellectual masochism, at least, right? So, you know, for example, I ordinarily watch Piers Morgan, whom I really hate, but, you know, I kind of love to hate in a way. And also he gives me exposure to things that you know I would normally not be exposed to whenever I'm in the US I watch Fox News and you know I'm you know first shocked but then fascinated by 
you know, this kind of whole universe of different interpretations of the world, of the world from mine. Uh, and then I listen to certain podcasts or I have friends, you know, whom I argue with on the political side of things or about, you know, interpretations of the world. And we send each other stuff and, you know, I do make the point of watching it. And then I think, you know, that leads to kind of healthy and robust discussions and conversations. You have to be ready for the for the possibility that actually you end up changing your mind about things. And, you know, the problem is this is a very clear gestaltic principle. Once you change your mind about one thing, it changes the whole configuration of how you see everything else, right? Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you know, you are a vegan, but you suddenly become more open to the idea of people going hunting, which seems completely crazy, I mean, or let's give an example that the audience might gravitate towards. If, you know, you are, I remember this is a true story in the early days of online dating, which was kind of still newspapers having apps where you could, you know, meet somebody, etc. cetera. Uh, I knew friends who went on a date through match.com, uh, eHarmony, and then Tinder, et cetera, and they had great compatibility, blah, blah, blah. So, and then once they go to the person's home, they realize that, you know, there is a Daily Telegraph or a Guardian in the room. So like, you know, so, oh my God, and the world falls apart, right? Mm. So I think we should make an effort to do this. And ultimately, I think one of the ways in which we can embrace these sort of like nuanced approach to values, beliefs, et cetera, is to not really take ourselves that seriously. I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, we are the product of a lot of serendipitous factors coming together, uh, genetics, upbringing, uh, family history, some things we have no control over, some things we think we have control over, but not really, choices, etc. One of the nicest virtues of humanity is our versatility and our ad adaptability. So I think, you know, uh, I measure how open somebody is by the number of kind of unpredictable activities or passions or interests or mm -hmm. features about them that they have. You know, mm -hmm. if knowing one thing about you enables me to predict everything else, you're kind of boring. <laughs> you're kind of boring. But also I know that might be my bias. You know, that might be my bias. Maybe I have this kind of tendency to seek eccentricity or exoticism. I also respect people who just don't want to mix. For 99% of our evolutionary history, we hung out with people, I mean, just 10 or 15 people. Most of them were genetically related. And, you know, they were very similar. There was actually a tax on going outside our group to explore the tribe next door. You would return with a lot of parasitic infections as we relearned in the COVID kind of years, uh, or you would be killed, eaten, beaten, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't rewire that hardware and even software that easily. But I do think that if we want to make advances and have true cultural progress, we need to become a little bit more tolerant of, you know, people who aren't like us. Yeah, and as I was sitting there, so it, it would have come last, but it really feels poignant here. I normally ask the question, what is an absurd thing about you that not many people know about? <laughs> this is a really good question. Uh, I mean, even like the absurd part is difficult because I think all of it is kind of normal, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I don't know about absurd, but yeah, I mean, you know, I want to say I am, I am extremely pushy and like when something gets in my mind, I don't get, I don't let go, you know, I mean, I wish I could, but then I mean, is that absurd? I think yes, because it contradicts a lot of the things that I'm trying to kind of preach or at least in theory promote. But then on the second part of your question, can people not imagine this? I don't know. I think people can see through me right away, right? So I don't, mm. uh, but yeah, I would say that, you know, I'm kind of a, I wish I could let go more easily. When mm. something enters my mind, you know, I become quite obsessional. I don't let go and I'm pushy. And, you know, I think it's always good to think about how your best friends and people who know you really, really well and who know most of the dimensions of your self-complexity would describe you. And mm -hmm. the first thing that my friends would say, 
I, I doubt any of them are watching is that, you know, he's a pain in the ass. <laughs> That's interesting. What I'm sitting with, and actually I had that thought before you said this, but uh, I could see through my therapy training and through discussions with my supervisors that uh, it takes about three years to work through projections when we are in contact uh, mm -hmm. with a person. Yeah. Um, and it can be longer depending on how, what our self process is and how fragile or, or sturdy it is. But I'm sitting with how much and how easily we think we are right, uh, yes. where most of our and even, uh, so where I work at the moment, the Francis Creek, there is an institute, Hello Brain. And, and yesterday I was re looking up, look, reading something which is called Reality Check. And, and I find it really interesting that we know that this is an inherent nature of a human being, mm -hmm. that it fills in the gaps. Yeah. And the way we fill in the gaps is formed often very early and then reified over time if we are exposed to the same thing over and over again. Yes. Uh, but we kind of forget that and then we go into an environment where we encounter difference. Yes. But then suddenly we think, oh, I'm not projecting me. I never do that. And then I sometimes sit with clients and I'm asking the question, who am I for this person? And then I started asking, but who is this person for me? Yes. Because thinking that I'm somehow different in this projection game is, is quite a disservice to the person. <laughs> yeah. So and I think I love that. I think, you know, you have to be basically comfortable not feeling the gaps or knowing that, you know, you might just be kind of randomly drawing bits or lines between one point and another. Yeah. Or just simply, you know, be comfortable being uncomfortable with. But mm -hmm. then that's kind of like a torturous experience. Then, you know, it it's is. Stay, and, you know, we can't apply it all the time. Like, you know, you can't go into an Uber and, you know, not uh, use your kind of uh, premeditated expectations or assumptions that, the person isn't going to turn around and shoot you or drive you somewhere else or that, you know, he hasn't uh, uh, on that day decided that it will be a good way to kind of not stop on the red line and kill himself or herself and you as well. So I think 95% of the times we have to not just rely on our intuition, but also rely on our prejudice expectations. Yes. But at least 5% of the time we can try to broaden our horizons in our imagination, I think then we can hope for a little bit of progress or more psychological progress in the world. Mm. And I'm sitting with the, um, so a friend of, I don't know if this is true research because I've never looked it up, but I've, um, a friend of mine uh, told me that there was some psych psychological research where they were showing and I don't know how you define a psychopath, but images of, of people who were psychopathic in some way mm -hmm. and just regular people. And then um, if people had less time to decide, they were more accurate okay. in finding out whether if you have more time to, to then start filling in the gaps, then you're actually less accurate. So sometimes that, in, that yeah. instinctual fear of like something's wrong here uh, is really important and I guess for me it's always that fine balance between how do you use your reptilian brain and everything we are gifted and everything that get that gifts us with mm -hmm. in a good way with our prefrontal cortex because sometimes we over over um uh, overemphasize the the prefrontal cortex and wanting to stay in it and analyze and and sometimes actually the gift of the reptilian brain is really, really important. So yeah. I think it's it's a little bit, it's basically what you've just said. I'm just using a different terminology. <laughs> exactly. And I think it's basically maybe it's about teaching our reptilian brain to actually coexist or yeah. you know partner or collaborate with you know our modern brain or homo sapiens brain or maybe even like the rational parts of it i do think you know the kind of system one system two uh, mm -hmm. framework of uh, behavioral economics is quite useful and then yeah fundamentally is you know understanding our limitations uh, mm -hmm. if you don't do that well you definitely can't upgrade your capabilities mm. so I'm, I'm conscious of time and i just maybe want to ask you we haven't spoken about your 
latest book and your work uh, on understanding how AI impacts and shape us. So maybe you can say something about that. But I really feel your body of work is such that we cannot cover it. Uh, but I hope we've touched on some important point and we've kind of entered the flavor by just by the fact that I'm a different interviewer from the ones that you've spoken to. Yes, and look, or, we don't know, we don't need to talk about the new yeah. book. So, but yeah, if people are interested in, it's called "I Human AI Automation and the Quest to Reclaim What Makes Us Unique," and it really examines the impact that AI or artificial intelligence is having and has had so far on us, on human behavior. And I talk a lot about some of the things we did cover, which is how AI is making us more impatient, impulsive, biased, narcissistic, self-centered. And maybe the only thing I would highlight is that there is, to go back to the beginning, you know, when you talked about maybe the potential advantages of, of making being human sexy, I do actually talk a lot about how in these 10 years, last 10 years, where we spent a lot of time being worried, paranoid about AI's ability to become more human-like, we sort of became more robotic. And we became more predictable, more sanitized, more sterilized. So, you know, so full circle is now closed because I do think that the fundamental quest is to sort of rediscover some of the things that actually make being human fun if not sex mm -hmm. and i am also sitting uh, as i was thinking about what you were saying uh is the way i was trained as a scientist i was really lucky to be part of a science school and what i learned there and i you were mentioning this many times was really not about like how to ask the good questions because in a way and you are also talking about how you develop expertise and noticing aha uh -huh, this doesn't fit this doesn't fit and i think that will change shape but it doesn't feel like it will be lost mm -hmm. uh, as long as there are people who have who are building schools uh, that kind of nurture that critical uh, and and almost dissident way of thinking um yeah. And I, 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 I mean, somehow it never scared me. The first time I sat down and I asked the question, I was immediately like, ah, like, ah, like I don't feel replaceable. <laughs> it really didn't feel like uh, that. But I mean, you never know. But it just, uh, even the AI chatbots, which I use for therapy, they are incredible. And mm -hmm. I use them for myself, mm -hmm. but only because there is a part of me that knows what I'm looking for. So there is that expertise that you've mentioned that uh yeah and i'm wondering yeah. how does this resonate with you uh, a lot and i think i mean you know you can ask a question uh because you really want to know something and and i think that's you know not a bad starting point uh you can ask a question because you really want your audience to know something and that might require a little bit of thinking right so if you watched my interviews before you kind of already knew something so they're like okay but maybe that's what your audience wants to know so you know the overlap or the tension between both is is there and needs to be acknowledged and then you can ask questions because you want to show how much you know which is typically you know the worst case scenario because for that you know you should be on the other side um so i think you know it's an it's it's important to uh embrace a certain element of naivety but again i think if you know a lot about someone or if you start to find out about someone or learn about someone it should trigger more questions and therefore sometimes you know that's even if you think about the interaction between humans and ai or human prompters and large language models or generative ai i think the more you interact with this tool the more you can ask questions that haven't been asked before. I, I would love to see, for example, the database that ChatGPT or OpenAI has on frequencies of questions, right? We, we've seen some of this in, in the early days of Google that you know only I think 15 or 10% of the questions were unique questions. Everything else is asked multiple times. But imagine the data that they have on us humans. Yeah. And the most ridiculous, the most sublime, the most creative, the smartest, and you know, the most pathetic or pet petty questions would have been asked. And you know, I, I guess that's my 
sort of like I'm a psychologist at heart and that's what I would like to know I'm fascinated by technology but I would like to mostly use it to understand humans mm -hmm. not the technology itself which is what I try to do with the book and it's interesting uh what I've as I was using chat GPT what I've noticed there was a moment where I got frustrated and it taught me about myself because I started calling him lazy and mm -hmm. I realized this is a <laughs> language learning model has like look at what you're projecting and what you would think of yourself yeah. if you've got here and yeah. how harsh you would be to yourself if you would feel stuck and yeah. and also with an or with another person and yeah. instead of actually going to the next step on on clarifying my question i would just name someone and be like oh you're just lazy where actually i was lazy to type in a precise question, I mean, a question precise enough to get the right answer. So there is a lot of learning that we can have just by how we speak with, with the model. How we interact, yeah, how we interact, yeah. And, and actually, yeah. I remember seeing a study a few weeks back showing that actually most people are much more polite when they interact with ChatGPT or generative AI than with other humans, you know, even though it's completely unnecessary. We said, oh, would you mind telling me, you know, what happened in 1998? Or, oh, do you mind translating this into Serbo Croatian? Or, oh, would you mind, you know, is it, and, you know, there's no need. You can be actually, you know, there isn't a human that you need to be empathetic towards so that you are trying to be cordial. But instinctively, I think it's part of anthropomorphizing this yeah. AI that we want to be in our best behaviors. Equally, when you lose it and when you say, oh, this was pathetic, you see a very kind of apologetic reaction that seems quite believable of some something that obviously can't feel guilty or can't truly feel sorry. Yeah. And I'm sitting with a friend of mine has made a reel which says, how people pleasing are you from, uh, I don't know, hello to please. <laughs> Can yes. you write this for me? <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so to circle this, uh, is there anything you want to add uh, um, that we ha kind of haven't covered, but you think it's a really important point? No, it was a very enjoyable conversation. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you for accepting it. <laughs>